Аллилуйя. sound goofy while I'm talking, it's because I have a lodging in my throat. Hallelujah. So good to see you here this morning. Praise God. The title of this message this morning is, What Happens After the Persecution? What Happens After the Persecution? Turn your Bibles, please, to Psalms chapter 4. Actually, this is kind of a couple sermons melding into one. And that's okay. And I want to begin with verse 1 of Psalms chapter 4. It reads like this. David says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast Enlarge me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Because it is, it is in the midst of persecution and distress that we're supposed to really be calling upon God. And when we call upon God the right way, so to speak, God meets us there and enlarges us. We've been studying in Jonah the book of Jonah, how that, it wasn't until Jonah was in the belly of the well, of, of, the, of the fish, the great fish, where he hit bottom of all bottoms before he really had an encounter with God and became to be enlarged in his own mind, soul, and body. And David here is saying, when I was in distress, you enlarged me. Listen, Christian people, I believe the church today is in distress. I believe we're in persecution. I'm in persecution. I've been, we've been in persecution for years. I'm still in persecution. My body still isn't what it should be. I'm still struggling to come out of COVID, to still have a voice. Y'all know that? You heard it, we're here, right? I mean, I'm still in the midst of persecution. I'm still in the midst of distress. But God comes and I'm enlarged. We are enlarged together in the midst of that distress. If the church is in persecution today with COVID and all the other stuff going on, we should be enlarged, not compressed, not put down, but enlarged, blessed by God. Say amen. Hallelujah. I've just never believed in shrinking away from it. Face it. Whatever it is, it's a problem, it's a circumstance, it's a situation. Maybe it's the greatest despair of all. Maybe it's a, a circumstance that is so disheartening. Okay? Okay? Don't shrink from it, but meet it head on. Set God before you and then meet it head on. Don't shrink from it. Church leaders shouldn't be saying, I'm, I have no idea what to do with COVID. I have no idea what the church is going to look like afterwards. Shame on you. You should be saying the opposite. God is going to increase the church. He's going to enlarge us. If you're right with God through all of this persecution, you're going to be increased. Say amen. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Man, that's good news. Amen. Wow. Jesus. 
Verse 2, O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? In other words, go a wayward way, seek another place. Seek something else other than the scripture in God for what the church is supposed to look like after COVID. Or what you as an individual Christian being is supposed to look like after persecution or COVID. And we seek other things. We look to other materials. We look to positive thinking. We look, we look to the mystical world. We go everywhere except where we're supposed to go. And that is before the throne of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 3. But know that the Lord hath set apart. Now get this. This is so crucial. And this is part of the crux of my whole message this morning. But know that the Lord hath set apart him who is godly for himself. God has set apart that individual who is godly. He has set that individual apart for himself. Only the godly. I have been set apart for God and for himself. There's an intimacy in that relationship that I'm supposed to have with the Lord Jesus Christ yes. and God the Father. It's not some theology. It's not some religion. It's not even Christianity. It's called a spiritual communing relationship with God. Communing with him. Fellowshipping with him. Knowing and learning and growing and being increased in the things of God. I belong to God. You belong to God. We belong to God. He owns me. He owns you. He owns us. Therefore, we have a specific place in God. Not to be put down, but to be raised up. Say amen. amen. Not to shy away from circumstances, but to take them head on. To face them head on. Now God has set apart. I'll come back to that scripture here in just a few moments. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now keep your finger there. Let's turn. Because I'll come back. Because I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. So keep your fingers there. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 12. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Paul here saying to Timothy, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And all, all, all who live godly, every single one of them. Okay, go back. Now go back. Stay there for a second. Now go back. The Psalms. <laughs> Psalms. What does it say? What did he say? But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is God before himself. Listen, folks, if we're found in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. If we've been set apart for the things of God, we're going to suffer persecution. That's right. The church is suffering it right now. I'm suffering persecution right now. You're suffering persecution. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. I want to get back to the title of this message this morning. But what happens 
after the persecution. See? That's where we're headed. Okay? Pastor, I agree with you going through persecution. Don't like it, don't want it, wish it wasn't around me, but that's okay. So tell us now what's going to happen after the persecution. I'll get to that in a moment. But just for all of us to understand that just because we've been called out by God to belong to Him doesn't mean that we're free from suffering. In fact, it means the opposite. If you've been called out to belong to God, you're going to suffer. Because He did. And we're going to partake of communion in just a few moments. All Christ suffered. All who will be righteous in Christ is going to suffer. But what happens after the suffering? I'll get to that in a moment. Let's continue to read. Now verse 4 of Psalms chapter 4. Stand in awe. We just sang that a few moments ago. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. David here now is emphasizing, and I want to emphasize to us, really, you know, you reach a, you reach a certain age in life where the, the most exciting thing that you're looking forward to after you've woke up in, you woke up in the morning and you've gotten up, and you, the thing that you're most excited about is when you can go to bed again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's when you know your role. Okay? You know, I get up, I get up, shower, I clean up. Oh, man, I cannot wait to go to bed tonight. <laughs> One of those reasons is because it's when my head hits the pillow that I'm really communing with God. And I'm, and I'm just praying in my mind's eye. And I'm praying in the voice of my soul. In the Spirit, I pray in the Spirit and, and I worship God and I just love God and I try to relax and try to just rest. You see, David knew about all of those secrets because as he grew up as a shepherd boy, listen to me, the majority, the far majority of his relationship with God was developed in the nighttime. Not during the day when he was busy taking care of the sheep and all that kind of stuff. You take care of the sheep busy during the day, and then here comes a cougar wanting to steal one of his sheep. And David says, Hey, Mr. Cougar, you should never have come here. Because last night, me and God, we had an encounter last night. And that encounter is now going to give me the power and the strength to kill you. Mr. Cougar, you should never have come here. You understand what I'm saying? It's in the nighttime. It's in the quiet, still time where that we develop that intimate relationship with God that He wants to have for us. Folks, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. Amen. And I believe this. Yes. In those end time few last seconds, I believe Jesus Christ wants His bride to grow in intimacy with Him. Yes, He does. To grow in spiritual intimacy with Him. And that means that a lot of things in this life that used to be important to me are no longer important to me. Right. And it means that the things that used to be, that I used to care a lot about and it used to entangle me, I no longer get entangled with them because my emotions and my energies and my passions and my intimacy is turning towards my relationship with Jesus Christ because when he comes I want to know him and see him as my redeemer yes. hallelujah you see and that's what David is talking about here in this verse stand in awe and sin not commune with your own heart upon the bed and be still verse 5 Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? 
Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Verse 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. In other words, when the wicked increased, then I, we saw their, just like today, the wicked is increasing. It's like they have, they have no trouble, trouble walls. They have no, no firewalls. They can say and do whatever they wanted to say and do. You know, they're part of the Marxist Party of America, the Socialist Party of America. And they just lie and say whatever they want to say. They don't care anymore. There's nothing to stop them. And David said, you know what? When I saw the wicked prospering in all of their ways, you increased me more. I wasn't taken down, but I was increased even more. Let's read this scripture one more time. What does he say here? Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than the time that their corn and their wine increased. Thou hast put gladness in my heart. Last week I preached about coming out of bondage, coming out of slavery, that God was going to give His people a new heart and a new spirit. And I said, that's what I believe He wants to give His people. His church before He comes is a new heart and a new spirit. And one of the aspects of that new heart and that new spirit is an overwhelming gladness. I can't explain it. I just am glad. It just, you know, I'm glad. Before I go back to bed tonight and go to sleep, I'm just going to be, oh, I don't know, glad. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Something's a stirring. Folks, let me tell you, something's a stirring. <laughs> something's a stirring. Hallelujah. Verse 8. I will obey it. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only maketh me to dwell in safety. Amen. Praise God. Now I want to look for the next few moments about people in the scriptures. And now I want to talk about what happens after the persecution. All great men and women of the Bible had to go through persecution. They all had to suffer. I just want to look at a few real quick and just kind of bring them out before we partake of communion. First, let's look at Job. Job's the most famous person in the world. Everybody knows about Job. Non-Christians, non-believers, they know Job. Job suffered incredible persecution. The devil came to God and said, yeah, you know what? If you just didn't watch over Job so much and favor him, you know, he would turn and curse you and die. God said, well, okay, let's do an experiment. And Job's going, an experiment? Don't, I don't want to be an experiment. God said, let's do an experiment, okay? I'll take my hand of favor off of him. You can do anything you want to him except take his life. We know the story. The devil did everything that he could except take his faith and steal his soul. And finally there came a point in time where God looked at the devil and said, that's enough. You know, folks, I'll believe before, just before Jesus Christ comes, he's going to look at the devil and say, that's enough. Amen. I'm calling my bride. Yes, that's enough. No more persecution. So what happened to Job after his persecution? We know the story. God doubled all of his wealth from what he had before persecution came. God doubled Job's wealth. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Joseph just for a moment. <clears throat> Joseph was the eleventh son of, was it Isaac? Jacob? Yeah, Isaac. Sold into slavery as his brother hated him. Poor Joseph as a young boy sold into slavery. Then was sent to prison. Suffered all kinds of persecutions. But then one day God said, that's enough of that. Now I'm going to begin to show you favor. And he called Joseph out and gave him favor with the king of Egypt. We know the story. 
And so Joseph was so smart, so diligent, and God was blessing his efforts so much for Egypt that he became more and more powerful. The second most powerful man in Egypt, except for the Pharaoh. One day his brothers came to him not knowing who he was, begging for food. Joseph kind of toyed with him just for a few moments and said, you don't know who I am, do you? They said, no, we don't know. He said, look at my ring. I'm your youngest brother. And they fell to their knees, began to weep. Joseph said, don't cry, stand up. It is for this hour, this moment, that God has chosen me to bless you. You thought you were doing me harm when you sold me into the slavery. But God has chosen me to bless you instead. What happened after Joshua, Joseph, <coughs> all of Joseph's persecution? He became an incredible blesser for the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at Noah just for a moment. What was Noah's persecution? It took about a hundred years to build the ark. For a hundred years, Noah put up with laughing, mocking, jokes, criticism, all kinds of reverie, people spitting on him, throwing alcohol on him as they go by, tease him and make fun. They had no idea what he was building. For a hundred years, Noah put up with that garbage. And then the day came when all the animals were safe. He shut the door and the persecution was over. All those others drowned as the earth was covered in water and Noah and his family and the animals were saved. Moving on after his persecution, the population, the rest of the earth through his children and he became Noah a great blesser of the things of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for a moment. We looked at them just for a little bit last week. They were taken into slavery by Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were very, very smart, intelligent men. They knew how to govern. Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, burned to the ground, took 10,000 10, Israel slaves, those guys included, took them back to Babylon into slavery. But gave these four men offices and jobs to do. We know the story, don't we? They were very good at what they were doing. But then the Egyptians tricked Nebuchadnezzar the king and made him create his own laws that would catch Daniel and the other three not bowing and worshiping the idol. And they knew that that would bring death to those four Israelites. Now when Nebuchadnezzar built that statue and declared that decree, folks, let me tell you, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into great persecution. They knew the next few years that it took to build that statue and to fulfill those decrees, they knew what was coming for them. They knew what was going to happen to them in great persecution. But then one day, when Nebuchadnezzar was about to climax the persecution, he threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in such a fiery furnace that it killed all their soldiers that threw them into the fire, killed them dead. Nebuchadnezzar heard voices. And he went and he looked and he said, didn't we throw three in there? We threw three, right? But there's four. Where did that fourth one come from? We don't know. And they're smiling and they're laughing. And they're joking. I wonder if that's the Son of God to deliver them from the persecution. 
Can you say amen? Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Nebuchadnezzar prayed. He loved Daniel. Oh man, I hope Daniel doesn't get eaten up. Daniel, if your God is real, I just pray that he saves you. Early the next morning, Nebuchadnezzar goes out, says, take the lid off. He goes, Daniel! Daniel says, I'm here! The persecution was over. Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego put them in the highest places possible within his kingdom to bless him and took all of those accusers, punched them, and killed them. What happened after the persecution? They reigned. They multiplied. They were blessed. I want to move now before we partake of communion. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, went through persecution on the cross. And when he hung there and bled, great drops of blood that flowed down his face, his back torn bits and pieces, his face unrecognizable from his beard being pulled out by his flesh. And God, Jesus, hanging on the cross, and God the Father looks down and says, I cannot look upon my son and turns his back on his son. And his son said, oh my God, oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Great persecution and despair. And the next three days he spent in hell. And he come out of hell. Set captives free. And 50 days later, filled 120 of his disciples full of the Holy Ghost. And then went and sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. Folks, listen to me now as I close. We might be going through persecution. There might be more. I'm going through persecution. I want it to end so badly. I want it to end. I pray this coming year that my persecution will end. Hallelujah. But my prayer is this. And if you're a godly individual and God has chosen you for himself, and you're going to pray this prayer this coming year. I'm asking, challenging not anybody for a New Year's resolution, but I'm challenging everybody for a New Year's prayer. And I'm challenging everybody to pray this prayer every day. Heavenly Father, I have no other calling. Heavenly Father, I have no other purpose. Heavenly Father, I have no other vision. Heavenly Father, I have no plans for the future except to belong to you for your pleasure. If you pray that prayer, you're a godly person. God has chosen for himself. Hallelujah. And you see, folks, that's what I think it means when persecution, when it ends. And I don't think we have much longer on this earth before Jesus Christ is going to come back. I don't think we're going to see another presidential election. I firmly believe within two years Jesus Christ is coming back. I could be wrong, that's fine. But I'm living my life like we're not going to see another presidential election. Jesus Christ is coming back. And the persecution is going to end. And the blessings are going to flow. And we're going to be enlarged. And then God is going to call us home yes. as his bride. Can you say amen? You see, I believe that's now upon us. I believe that is now present with us. That the persecution is almost over. Some people are saying gasoline prices will be doubled next year. We saw on TV the other day, in some places, a gallon of milk is $9. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Yeah. Yeah. And our faith is in Him. Can you say amen? amen. 